I hope everyone's well. We're doing skincare live Q and A, and I am joined today in our little room by Dr. Angel Marto, who is a consultant dermatologist. But I was really interested in yeah. understanding, like, what goes on on our face and the history of it, yeah. and what it can lead to, what signs it can give us for the future of our skin, which I think you're going to talk a little bit about today. That's right. So I think one of the questions that seemed to come up a lot was face mapping. Yeah. What is it? What are the benefits of it? Yeah. What do we know about it? So face mapping comes from essentially traditional Chinese or Ayurvedic medicine. Yeah. And the idea is that having spots in certain parts of your face, be that the forehead, the mm -hmm. cheeks, the nose, the chin, can be signs of internal issues with the body. Is, so, there, is there other, like, I mean, is it, it's not just about spots, because on here there's going mm. to be people who have spots, there's going to be people with rosacea, with Indeed. eczema, Indeed. With, with psoriasis. So do all of those things also given, is it only spots that give an indication of what else is going in the body, or is it those things too? So acne is the traditional one that people oh, think it, yeah. of. Um, rosacea often has been linked as well, mm -hmm. eczema less so. Okay. But usually the top two are acne and rosacea that people will think of or potentially see an integrative practitioner for. Yes, and then if they're feeling, I mean, when you, let's, can we start with rosacea, actually? Indeed. All right, so let's say somebody has it, and I know that there's traditional ways of treating, and there's what I call Eastern practices, which are just do things differently. And we've had on this show mm -hmm. different, you know, we've had both opposites. Yeah. But how would you then say that if you're looking at a face and mm -hmm. you're taking that Eastern medicine approach, because you integrate, really, how would you then read somebody's face you know would you read things about them if they have rosacea or would it be more what they eat and how they're having their behaving in their you know what's happening in their life etc yeah so i think my approach would be actually more of a traditional western medicine approach okay but i do think that rosacea is one of those conditions where you do have to put together what's going on with the person in their life and lifestyle issues yeah as well as what's going on to the skin mm. so that is one example of a prime skin condition where what you eat may have a direct impact on what your skin is doing. So making sure that you're getting high levels of omega-3 or mm -hmm. healthy fats mm -hmm. in your diet. The Western diet is classically quite low in omega-3 and quite high in omega-6 and 9. Mm -hmm. And the ratio of 3 to 6 and 9 is quite important. Mm -hmm. 6 and 9 are thought to be pro-inflammatory. Yeah. Omega-3 is thought to be anti-inflammatory. So, so you would be taking omega-3, but not 6 and 9. Not 6 and 9, or trying to up the amount of 3 that you're getting. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Yeah. That can either come directly from your diet. Yeah. So making sure that you're having, say, two portions of oily fish a week. Mm -hmm. So your mackerel, your sardines, your yeah. wild farm salmon. This you, is all for rosacea people we're discussing All for rosacea now. people. Yeah. It can also help with people who've got issues with eyes and rosacea. So 20% of people that have rosacea will also have eye issues And, and they'll well. have eye issues as in mm. they'll have redness around eyes or they'll have eye issues as in vision issues. Dryness, redness, styes, irritation. So often visual things that you can see. So okay. it's not visual So symptoms. inflammatory things. We're talking Indeed. still inflammatory. So, that's a, so it's a higher trajectory of people who will have that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So omega-3, diet, can't get it from your diet. Supplement is the next best thing. Yeah. Second thing that's really, really important in rosacea-prone skin is actually thinking about what you're putting on the skin. Mm -hmm. We know that people that are rosacea-prone have got issues with skin barrier. Yeah. So the skin barrier is there to keep good things in and bad things out. Mm -hmm. But if the skin barrier isn't functioning properly, rosacea can flare up. Mm -hmm. So it is very, very important that when products are being applied to the skin, cleansers, moisturizers, makeup, all of those things aren't containing high levels of fragrances Mm -hmm. may contain minerals, all things that can actually help boost the skin barrier rather than damage it. Do you believe it's mm. possible, because I have a few dermatologists I speak to, yeah. always differing views, but yeah. I'm interested in knowing your, your view, yeah. that if somebody presents with a rosacea skin, mm. it's possible to cure their rosacea? I think it's possible to control it to the oh, point... See, I, yeah. Yeah, to I, the I, point I have somebody who feels right. they, that they can take... Yeah. You know, I, uh, there's this woman in America and she believes you can really, like, nearly remove sensitivity from skin. But I, if you're yeah. saying control, that's really different. You can control it to the degree that mm. it might be very clear that somebody doesn't have rosacea anymore, but the risk is it may always come back. Yeah. So I think when we're saying we're curing something and we're completely getting it rid of it forever, mm -hmm. I think that's, um, you never say never. Because you, so, so all those say. things which you're, you have a sensitivity to. So, okay, yeah. so we've done like 
those things that you're putting inside your body, Indeed. which are really important, and to look at those those the fishiness of it all. Yeah. Um, what about supplements? Do you believe in things like zinc or things that are anti-inflammatory to take for rosacea? I think they can be of benefit because yeah. one of the very key things, and again, this is very specific to the types of people that I see, but it is very popular now to become plant-based mm. for the environment or for ethical reasons. Mm. And you can have a very healthy plant-based diet, but one of the issues is that you may have nutritional deficiencies in other areas yeah. if you're not very careful about how you switch things over. So but, it, I, but is what you're saying is plant-based is better for rosacea? Or no, not? what I'm saying okay. is if we are making dietary changes to mm -hmm. be better for the planet or you know, making ethical reasons, yeah. you might end up removing a lot of things from your diet. And if you're removing a lot of things from your diet, yeah. your skin wound healing won't be as good, your skin okay, barrier so, function won't okay. be as good. Yeah. So I do think there is a role for supplementation. So things like iron, mm -hmm. B12, folate, zinc are all very beneficial to the skin yeah. and the way that the skin will heal. Great. We're going to leave this list at the end too, just so that people who are watching, so I've got to find my glasses, not yet. Oh, um, yeah. I just, thanks a lot, Faith. But so for people who are watching, because it's really interesting advice and I think it's helpful if you do have rosacea to look at that. So we've, we've talked about that kind of food you eat, supplements. I think just that the levels of stress in your life. I mean, it is, uh, you know, I have friends where their rosacea plays up tremendously. It can be when they eat um, inflammatory foods like spices and, and, and sugar and things like that. But also just, it's sometimes very difficult to, to control our emotions. Yeah. But, you know, would we then be saying that if you have got that, what are the sort of more meditative things you bring in your life? Should you be looking at, if you don't, doing things like yoga, you know, just having that calmness in your body uh, yeah. and things like that. Yeah, a yeah. massive advocate of that. Do you feel that? Do you see that different in your, in your patients? What's interesting is at medical school, we were taught about a third of people with skin conditions, their skin conditions would be aggravated by stress. I actually yeah. think it's more than that. It's yeah, probably more I'd like about 50, half. 70 yeah, I, I agree with you, yeah. And there is no doubt that if you are stressed out, and we know it's impossible to remove stress from modern day life, you know, yeah. COVID has shown us that. But to find a way to not have the stress play into your skin, and I think yeah. techniques that work for the individual, so exercise can work for some, yeah. meditation, yoga, definitely two things I am a huge advocate yeah. of, having recently qualified as a yoga teacher. Fantastic. And yeah. I do think that it's that whole thing of, if you get stressed out, your skin gets worse. Mm. Your skin gets worse, you get yeah. more stressed yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not just that. You might be going through a good phase with your skin, rosacea being a good example of mm. this, but rather than enjoying the fact that your skin is good, you're living with threat or fear of when yeah. it might flare up again yeah. in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. So rather than going, yes, it's great today, you're mm. thinking in two weeks' time, I've got to go to the spa with my friends, what if my skin flares up? Yeah. So it's removing that threat aspect of yeah. it as well. So the other thing I think is um, therapy, and I think actually trying to disconnect that skin mind you mean therapy as in go and have a therapist yeah clinical psychologist okay. for stress management well, that's like i mean that is interesting and i mm. think that it does you know there are some people who've never done therapy in their life and i think it's a very scary thing to consider it yeah. and there's people who have done it so much that you use <laughs> it puts you off doing it sure um and then i think there's a really healthy way to approach just growth you know personal growth yeah. and and so however you view view it but that sense would you like to you know go on a journey of personal growth and a part of that could be a therapist it could be a coach a life yeah. coach it could be anything like that but yeah. it, it, I, I do you know I, I like that you said it I think mm. it is you know sometimes people get a bit uncomfortable to suggest things like that but mm. I think it's really important. We're going to take some questions now on yeah. rosacea, and then we're going to go on to just, yeah. you know, other things that really irritate our skin, which we're going to talk about that little face mapping mm. in more detail. I'm joined here, if you've just joined me, Dr. Angel Marto, who is a consultant dermatologist, and we're just talking about how our skin shows our emotions and feelings and what we can do to dial down the stress to help our skin. Um, Liz, I have mild rosacea flare-ups, heating and weather. I use azelaic acid serum and hyaluronic acid as part of routine. SPF is a must all year round. It's needed up a lot. I mean, it's a, that's a very good routine, I would say. It absolutely um, is. And, you know, I just, we also, um, I love peptides because I think they're not uh, damaging. You know, there's certain ingredients. I always yeah. feel like strong vitamin Cs and things, which, which people with retinoids should be careful of or, or strong yeah. acids. But... You know, we've had quite a few people who have been working, uh, you know, doing, changing their routine with us, and they've introduced, not during a flare-up, a PHA, actually 
oddly helping to hydrate the skin uh, from that level. Yeah. And then peptides, because I think that a lot of people who have rosacea are told, you know, it's the top left bit of the aisle for you. You know, there's no opportunity to go on those lovely skincare journeys your friends do. Or that's right. What can I do for that? those little crow's lines or for the dullness in my skin or whatever? So that's why I think peptides are interesting because they don't, they're supportive, they're helping things grow, they're giving you the proteins for the amino acids, you know, yeah. they're like, they're, 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 they're the soldiers. And so I, I like the way skincare is evolving because yeah. 10 years ago, I don't think there would have been that you would have been saying as a lake acid for inflammation and you know no perfumes and you know just like a very black and white regime yeah and i think actually the spf is really important i'll yeah. come back to that because 80 percent of people that have rosacea their redness is driven by ultraviolet light from the sun yeah that's a very high stat let's it just is. let's just let me do a real oprah and repeat that stat 80 yeah. percent of inflammation of rosacea suffers, rosacea yeah. suffers is driven by UV light. Ultraviolet light will drive the redness. So the SPF mm. isn't there as treatment. It's there to prevent Tick. that redness yeah. getting worse yeah. over time. So yeah. it's absolutely crucial. Key. That's such a good stat. I want to write that stat down. Can we remember that stat <laughs> yeah. afterwards? I think it's a brilliant stat that. Yeah. It's, because I think sometimes you need to hear something so clearly to make you think, actually, I've been dabbling yeah. with SPF. Let me just commit. Yeah. Let me commit. Um, we'll do a couple more questions mm. and then we'll just go on. And are there any faith that you've uh, yeah. seen there? Is yeah. safe to microneedle on rosaceous skin? I think that's uh, aggravating for rosaceous Yeah, yeah I would I agree. Yeah, um, I just think you should avoid it. Again, yeah. anything that's disrupting the skin yeah. barrier in that yeah. manner, you have to. Uh, and, and you know, it's, uh, microneedling is to kind of damage the skin so it repairs itself. And I think rosacea is already having such a problem repairing itself that in the way you're just throwing oil on the fire. Indeed. I mean, yeah. Laser treatments are far safer. Laser treatment. So what, yeah. if somebody has rosacea, do you believe there's a, if somebody wants to go to that next step, yeah. that what are the re laser treatments you think are good? So for redness, yeah. um, you're either talking about broadband light, like yeah. IPL, yeah. or you're talking about pulse dye lasers. Yeah. Both of them work by targeting blood vessels underneath the skin surface. Mm. So if you've got rosacea prone skin, you've got super reactive facial blood vessels, yeah. super reactive facial nerve endings. Yeah. What the laser treatments will do is they will shrink down those blood vessels underneath the skin. Okay. So it's like gonna stay on because sometimes we have this issue. So um, we'll write down as well afterwards yeah. um, those lasers that you think are good because I think people do feel should they go down that path. Bags under the eyes. I mean, we'll get onto this because yeah. we're doing face mapping. So it's all gonna come. Um, menopausal eyes, there's a lot of uh, uh, ads. Uh, microneedling one, currently battling inflammation of my scalp and losing my hair. Any advice to settle the scalp, please? This is interesting because, thank you, Julie, for that question, because I think that scalp is something that I lost quite a lot of my hair during COVID, so I actually realised the importance of a dermatologist yeah. to look at my hair. Indeed. And so what would your advice be? I mean, everyone has different reasons why their hair is getting thinner, and here, inflammation for your scalp, losing your, we don't know the reasons for that, Julie. But mm -hmm. would you say some of the advice we've given about reducing stress in your life is also going to help hair? Yeah, hair loss often is multifactorial, so there's mm. never one cause for it, and mm. stress can be one of the biggest drivers, nutritional deficiencies and inflammatory conditions, which yeah. can affect the body, can affect the scalp yeah. as well. Yeah. So I think in this particular case, it's worth having a chat to somebody who can look at the scalp, yeah. diagnose what the underlying condition is, and give treatment for that, and the hair loss should settle. Okay, that's great. And I wonder, because you can't put at the moment, I mean, there's a few SPF sprays. Mm. If you talk about the effect of ultraviolet light yeah. on our skin, mm. is there the same with hair? And should we be always wearing a hat if we have hair loss? Because then I also think the sun makes my hair grow more. So I'm a bit torn with that of what to idea. do there. Yeah. So in actual fact, if you are losing hair and there are areas where the scalp is visible, it is just as vulnerable to sunburn yeah. as facial skin. So we always With the same results of... Uh, you know, potentially yeah. issues with sun damage, potentials yeah. of developing issues like skin cancers in the future. Yeah. So I think we think of SPF as the only way that we should be looking after our skin in the sun. Yeah. But that's just one tool, you mm -hmm. know, staying in the shade, wearing a hat, protective clothing, all of those things are equally as important. Yeah. So I would say, actually, this is why men often get more sun damage than women do, because the hair is a natural SPF. It yeah. performs a physical barrier. Yeah. But if the scalp is showing, it definitely needs to be protecting it. It does. Okay, that's good, because we forget this stuff. Um, all right, now, Amanda's going to take us very beautifully into hormonal acne. Um, so I'm going to start with this, but I'm also going to... 
I think, let's just do an overview, but I just want to, Amanda's question leads in well. So hormonal acne after coming off the pill, any advice, ladies? So that's an interesting one. But let's just talk about, um, people get spots in different ways. And some people get them, I had them from 13 to 30. The only thing that stopped me was Rakuten. Yeah. Um, and then I got them again when I was going through menopause and I was trying to balance out my HRT. And so I was taking some days too much of one thing. So yeah. it actually made me have more spots. So yes. too much estrogen or too much testosterone, whatever. But what do you think are the most important rules? I mean, we, we have talked about basic looking after mm. spot, skin, which has propensity to spots. But can we talk a bit about where they are on the face and what that could be an indication of? So often with teenagers and teenage acne, yeah. you see an oily T-zone. Um, so you often yeah. see spots on the forehead, nose, chin. Yeah. As women get older, that pattern changes mm -hmm. and you often get what's known as U-zone acne. And that's often yeah. acne on the chin, the lower jawline, underneath and the, the neck. neck. Yeah. We're not entirely certain why that pattern changes, but there is an idea that the mm -hmm. oil glands that sit in the lower part of the face may be slightly more responsive to hormones that can drive acne. Okay. So in yeah. particular, androgen hormones like yeah. testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. Yeah. So that's definitely something that we see that women will say every month without fail, I notice I get a flare up somewhere around here. Yeah. With regards to when one should be doing something about it, I always feel with skin, if you are getting ongoing spots, they're leaving scarring, mm. or more importantly, they're affecting your mental health. Yeah. It's really important to get that stuff sorted out sooner rather than yeah. later. Yeah. Because we absolutely know that if you have troublesome acne, it massively affects your self-esteem and your confidence. I mean, it's interesting. I would say that, just from personal experience, and I have to say this thing, it affected my confidence so much, and I have, my daughter's 19, she has yeah. friends who have, have it and friends who don't have it. Lila has a few. She's kind of not as concerned as I was as a teenager, it's interesting. And mm. it's interesting especially with all the social, social media, media today. And I think there's something about, you know, she'll very comfortably go on a flight with me and she'll have these salicylic acids, you know, yellow stickers. stars, stickers on. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, I've got a spot, do that. And it stops me picking it. And she's sort of practical about it. And sometimes she says, you know, she then thought maybe, I, I actually looked at it and said, maybe you want to, you know, look at it. And when she's now on a prescription azelaic acid sure. and just doing actually overnight clarity, which is our, our retinoid, but just yeah. with a good kind of gentle stuff and a bit of an acid, but not too strong, yeah. you know, just that, Slightly gentle, but it is very um, interesting psychologically because more people are affected than others. But I think you have some women also, and this audience is predominantly a woman 30 mm. plus, yeah. who never had spots and perimenopausal, menopausal, they're like, I've got spots, what, yeah. what happened? So yeah. what you're saying is that gland is now affected. Is there anything also in the fact that our face falls south? Yeah. So do some of our glands end up here? I mean, is there anything in that? I'm just interested. No. Do you okay. know there's not? But what I will say is acne scarring becomes more prominent as well. Yeah, it separates. Older. Why yeah. does that separate? Because I have it here. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I did have a CO2 laser years ago. Yeah. But why, why does our skin separate as we get older? So as we get older, <laughs> so we've got about... 30 different types of collagen in our body. Yeah. And type one and type three are the main ones in the skin. And they're the ones that kind of give a, a scaffolding yeah. in the skin. And as we get older, we start to lose collagen. So that so collagen that just... matrix starts to separate. Mm. Mm. So any scarring you've got or slight indents, they kind of sink deeper yeah. as that matrix comes yeah. apart. Yeah. And that's why often scarring looks worse with when time it does. Yeah. rather than when you're yeah. say in your teens or your twenties. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah. And I've, I mean, I, for that, I do throw things on it. I throw retinoids, I throw um, peptides on it because yeah. I feel they do, I'm looking at things to support. I wouldn't throw collagen on it because I think collagen is like, this is a marketing thing of, it, hey, put collagen on to make your collagen. No, you need no. other ingredients to make your collagen. So I think that's such a, when I see and read that, and yeah. I was just thinking like with the Revitalift thing that's going on at the moment of just, they're saying collagen to help grow collagen. You're like, mm, you gotta be yeah. careful about how you here yeah, because no, you know it, you've got to say it correctly um i'm just going to go to some more questions um so so this lady here she's come off the pill yep. and she's got hormonal acne why does that happen so the reason for that is the pill is actually a treatment for acne yeah because i was on dna when i was younger yeah, yeah which is yeah, which yeah, was yeah. a great pill for acne yeah, done was. This. yeah but what happens is when you come off the pill that suppression that the pill naturally has been providing all those years 
goes away. Mm. So your skin goes back to that baseline that yeah. it wanted to be before you started the pill, and that's why. Yeah, that is so. So therefore, you've just got to then treat it as somebody who has a propensity to a little bit of spots acne. That's right. And then take that course of action that we've discussed of maybe acylic acids, prescription Sansalic retinoids, uh, yeah. yeah, tretinoins, and, yeah. and things like that. Um, I'm using your plump up and overnight sensation. My face seems more hydrated. But when do you suggest, what do you suggest for the inherited crepe-like lines? Crepe-like. So I don't know if you just mean that generally you're getting little crepey lines. And I think that is retinoids, vitamin really, a, and yeah. vitamin A, um, I'd say. So keep going with that. Does UV rays affect you even if you're inside? This is a good one because we have Alice Hart Davis, who I'm yep, sure you know, I lovely do. Alice, and she has a something called the Treatments Guide. It's fantastic if you want to do another step and know, know which lasers and, and microcurrents and everything to use. But she was the one who probably really said to me, Trini, I've, I've been to so many lectures recently where you know that there is an issue around you don't think just in direct sunlight you're getting UV damage. So will you talk to me about your thoughts on that too? Yeah, absolutely. So ultraviolet light comes directly from sunlight. So if you are indoors, mm -hmm. but you are not sitting by any windows, yeah. you're not getting any sunlight. Yeah. So it's fine. You don't need sunscreen. Yeah. But if you have a desk by a window, yeah. UVA light, which is the longer wavelength of light, it's the one that penetrates deeper into the skin, yeah. that does actually penetrate window glass. So in that context, if you're sitting for eight hours, working from home, right by a window, there probably is merit in mm. wearing sunscreen. Yeah. Now, the main merits come really from if you're worried about the aging of the skin or if you've got issues like pigmentation, all mm. of which can be driven by that particular wavelength of light. So yeah. yes, if you're getting sunlight indoors, it is worthwhile. Same if you have a job where you drive a lot and you're I sitting know. in a car for long periods yeah, of time. And you must, I mean, I know to swim in where there's definitely that pigmentation yep. that side because you're just thinking I'm in the it's car all day. In. It's coming in and also yeah. hands as well because the hand is on the steering wheel That's always. Right. If you live in the UK, that hand, but if you live in the US, that hand, if you live in Australia, that hand. And this is back to front, so all my hands yep. will be, uh, be, <laughs> be appearing wrong. Um, um, okay, um, Carol, this is just a general one, um, but we'll go because I feel for Carol. Carol, I was recently very sick with a um, gastrointestinal virus. Mm. My skin is much more dehydrated than usual, flaky and dull. What's the fix? I mean, she's lost a lot of water fluid, and yeah. fluid. And I mean, it's fluid, isn't it? Fluid and then emollient body washes, lots of moisturizer. Um, yeah. And hopefully doing that consistently should settle within a couple of days. Yeah, because I think dehydration and dryness are different things in this. And I think it's we always on this channel talk about understand the difference between the two but when you've had something like that your body is so dehydrated so it is those and then hyaluronic acid would help too just in that final stage of your routine to hold on to some of the water but you've got to be drinking more water too for the hyaluronic acid to work better because if you're just drinking coffee all day <laughs> and using it and and living in arizona it's going to be um, so it is yeah. environment it's it's what your body can hold on to water wise lots of different things um faith questions darling um, yes someone has asked what's the between collagen and retinol? Oh, big one. Um, so I can start. I mean, yeah. do you want to no, start? No, no, you go. Okay, so so if you're talking about um, ingredients in skincare, retinol is a very generic term. It's a retinoids, and there's many different types of them, and they are derivatives of vitamin A. And if you have prescription, it's usually tretinoin or, or different deferin or, um, or, or retin A, which is what I took 40 years ago. Yep. And they're already retinoic acid. Everything else non-prescription is it will turn to retinoic acid inside your skin and it will turn by converting once or twice, depending on the ingredient you're using in the, in the retinoid. So it could be granactive retinoids. It could be retinol, retinal, retinol palmitate. I always say don't use it. Um, but just they can work more softly on the skin when you do prescription. There's always that kind of cycle in your month where you feel, you know, it's flaky and you can't put makeup on properly. And if you don't want that downtime and you don't have chronic acne, I think there's very good levels of ingredients. So what retinoids do, I'm, I feel like on, on display because no, you know this, but what retinoids do is they help to accelerate the turnover of new skin. So they're sort of pushing it through and collagen is a part of that new skin you've got collagen and elastane those two friends and they give you the plumpness they give you that level of hydration so by using retinoid you help the development of that collagen coming up quicker and, and just feeling fresher that's the one way i put it feeling fresher yeah now collagen 
a collagen. Yeah, we know what protein. it is inside the yeah. skin. But if you put collagen in topical skincare, the problem is it's a massive ingredient. It yeah. is a huge protein. Mm. Yeah. And your skin is really effective as a barrier. It will not let a protein like collagen through it to actually suddenly become part of the collagen in your skin. Yeah. So I am inclined to agree with you mm. that I don't think collagen in skincare is particularly useful. Yeah. Often if a product contains collagen, it'll be the other ingredients in it that might be doing the bulk of the work. Yeah, I mean, I would say, I'm so glad you said that and yeah. I didn't have to say it yeah. because I don't want to put down other uh, skincare brands. But I do think that we sometimes hear words in skincare where we think, oh, I want that. I, 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 yeah. I know that word means plump skin. So if it has it in it, I'll feel I have plump skin and that's what you know the beauty industry is about is inspiring you to feel what that product would do for you but it's about education it's about knowledge it's about really finding the truth in all of those lists at the back of what ingredients are in something what they'll do and I think what I get from yours most is collagen is a really big molecule size mm. where's it gonna go you know how can it get yeah. smaller to go in your skin it's it doesn't right. so so that's I, I think that's a very good yeah. um, good one. And there's lots of collagen creams which feel very nice because they've got lovely emollients in them and you're going to put them on if you're, oh, my skin feels plump. Yeah. And it's so true what you say. It's those other ingredients and also the yeah. base of that cream that's going to make you feel, the texture's going to make you feel that and, yeah. and you know, how it rubs in is going to make you feel that. And, and it's like, sometimes that's enough for people, but when you, when you grow up in skincare, I think you realise you want ingredients that will really help to transform your skin. Yeah. Okay. So I'm now going to just, uh, um, Faith, yes, yes. some more okay. questions. Yeah. Um, someone has asked, what is it about your diet that causes acne? Is it dairy or sugar? Oh yeah. This is a big one because diet, I mean, you know, yeah. let's look at the TikTok, you know, <laughs> scaremongering all right, of so many girls and, and adults now will think, you know, oh my God, my daughter's doing that. Is that right? But the biggest ones obviously are don't have dairy. You know, yeah. my daughter spent three months not having dairy. And then yeah. I suddenly was like, Lila, you're, you're lacklustre. But, but tell us what your opinion is on this. Yeah, so the diet acne story is, it's quite a long one. And people have been talking about this literally since the 1940s. Papers yeah. go back this long. Yeah. If you look at all of the data that we currently have, there are probably a small select group of people who are sensitive to dairy mm -hmm. that can cause acne. Mm -hmm. For the vast majority of people, it probably makes no difference. Really? Like what proportion would you think? Is that like a 5%, 95%? I mean, are we talking that it's much smaller than people might imagine? It's much smaller than people might imagine. Yeah. The other okay. thing is, if you look at the dairy data, it seems to be that low fat dairy is more of a problem than full fat dairy. Yeah. And one of the reasons people think that's the case is when you remove the fat from the dairy, what you're leaving behind is all of the carbohydrates or the Which sugar. Is the sugars. And whether yeah. it's actually the sugar then that's indirectly yeah. driving the issue. So yeah. that brings you to the second point. If you look specifically at female adult acne, yeah. there is some emerging data that shows that diets that are high in sugar mm -hmm. or high glycemic index foods, yeah. foods that really spike your, your sugar levels yeah. very quickly, yeah. they can drive acne. Mm. So it's not that sugar can't be part of a healthy diet, but you just have to think about moderation and yeah. how much you're having of it. Yeah. And one of the things that I see really commonly is people will cut out dairy mm -hmm. and switch to something like oat milk instead. Which is much sweeter. Which is much sweeter. Oat yeah. milk has got the highest glycemic index of all the plant milks. Yeah. So people are cutting something out thinking it might be bad for them, and it probably isn't, yeah. and switching it to something which we know is actually super mm -hmm. high in sugar is probably actually worse for your skin. Yeah. So if you are going to switch to a plant-based milk, then unsweetened almond or soy is probably far better from uh, an acne yeah. perspective yeah. than going for oat. I like that. And I just I was looking at oat recently because I have switched from dairy to because I actually don't like the taste of milk no. so things but I yeah. did feel because I was reading the, glu uh, the glucose goddess who yeah. has a very s specific opinion she started yeah. at 23 and me I think or something yeah. so she the, this is this book that I because they know I'm on a journey ago. so uh, inflammation for you know just m moment m mobility of yeah. having my body not having aching knees all these things yeah. but I think having that sense of you know, so what, I think what I liked about the Glucose Goddess is she does an Instagram account and some people don't like it. I have a dietitian in, in uh, Australia who I mm. love, who just is so against what she believes mm. in. But she did tons of trials. She wore that thing of a diabetic. The she worked at a company that did DNA analysis mm. and, and so did a lot of research before. But she has these very interesting graphs of like you eat 
a cookie on its own and your glycemic level goes like that. You have like a proper meal and then you have that cookie, your glycemic level stays stable. So if we then are saying mm. our glycemic level can associate with acne and with, with having spots, mm. then how do you then eat? It's all is also what I like about what she said, I think, mm. is it's not always about remove everything because I think there's no. a great propensity in our life today remove it all out and some of these things have good things in it for Absolutely. us but it's the order in which you eat things yeah you know and, and not like that sort of you know the banana at three o'clock with nothing else or yeah. just chocolate yeah. um it's 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 like have some protein first and then have that sweet thing so I've started doing that a lot but sorry yeah. um do we think that if somebody ha is a uh, let's say she's a woman having menopausal acne that diet is going to have anything to do with it or is it just that there's less sugar and it will be less bad whereas a teenager it might be the oils the sebaceous glands are blocked the keratin's yeah. getting hardened you know are they slightly different when you look at them so i think from the current data standpoint it seems to be that it's the adult acne that seems to be linked to the high glycemic okay. index rather than the okay, teenage that's lot. interesting because with a teenage lot we know that it's their spike in testosterone even girls will get this as yeah. well is what suddenly wakes up their oil glands yeah. and then the organs yeah. get plump and juicy start yeah. throwing out more oil which yeah. is what causes the acne yeah. but for the adult patient it is definitely worth bearing in mind thinking about sugar intake not cutting out, I'm not a big fan of restriction either, yeah. but it makes perfect sense what you said. If you have a proper meal first, it's the fiber in that meal, all the other things that you're putting in that will slow down the absorption then yeah. of that, that sweet treat that you might have afterwards. Yeah. How, how does caffeine affect our skin apart from dehydration if it's coffee? I'm gonna come back to this because we talked about rosacea at the beginning yes. and definitely yeah. caffeine in rosacea sufferers can be a potential trigger because it can cause constriction and dilation then of the blood vessels and contribute and that, to flushing. Yeah. Again, though, I don't think either is like massive restriction of everything. Yeah. So I feel with caffeine, it's one of those things, as long as you're not having 10 cups of coffee a day, you're probably fine. I wouldn't cut yeah. it out altogether, yeah. but it's about thinking about that full diet and how you eat and the pattern of eating yeah. over a sustained period of time. Yeah, that and, and maybe if you're in a rosacea flare up, then cut down. just cut, cut down. down, you know, so, yeah. and, and anyone who has a rosacea knows that difference. You know, flare up and when you have it, but it's just kind of controllable. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. So um, we've given lots of information on uh, rosacea, which we will post at the end of the live. We've just posted up. I'm afraid. I hope it's safe. Did it say? Yeah, it's safe. Great. Safe. Fantastic. So um, moving on now to um, I just I, I want because I just want to know. And I know that you're not uh, Eastern pra medicine yeah. practitioner, but I do appreciate that you bring your learning and reading of other different ways of looking at things into your whole practice, which yeah. I love. And, yeah. and as yourself, you also become a yoga instructor because yeah. you kind of know the importance in the relation of skin and lack of stress. 100%. But if we um, look, there's, there's times when I'll get a spot right here and it will come in the same place mm. all the time. It's usually, funny enough, when I put on too much estrogen, mm. you know, or maybe too much, no, too much estrogen. But why? Will something come exactly the same place endlessly? There's a couple of reasons that could be. You yeah. could have like a deep acne cyst if you've been acne prone that just hasn't ever completely healed. Oh, so even it's just, over like 20 years? Even over 20 years. Okay. And it could just be sitting there with a little bit of scarring and something that can just flare up hormonally from yeah. time to time. Yeah. And now it will we, go there. So, so it kind of yeah. knows to go there. Because is that like the weak spot? to create the spot? It's probably just you've got a higher density of oil glands there. Okay. So one of the reasons we get acne really face chest back is because we've got our most oil glands sitting in those yeah. areas. And I think for some people, it's like some people will say, I only ever get spots on one side of the face. Why is that? Yeah. And I suspect that? all of that is just related to where your oil glands are located underneath the skin. And that's something that happens as you're developing as an embryo in mum's womb and you develop from the midline, things travel to both sides, and it might just be that more oil glands have settled on one and, side. And that can be that you have more on one side and less on yeah. the other. Because I thought I always thought we were all equal, but faces are never symmetrical, no. and I do know that. So no. And the other thing is yeah. HRT. I mean, I'm seeing so many people that have been put on testosterone the wrong HRT. or progesterone, but mm. both of those can trigger acne as well yeah. for the first time in yeah. women in their 50s or their 60s. Yeah, and it's just getting the um, amounts right. That's right. I think, and I, I did go with somebody who was uh, sort of, I'll look back and say, not brilliantly qualified to deliver, um, you know, a very sort of uneven delivery right. uh, system for the, for the testosterone and the progesterone. So yeah. that did affect me and I got yeah. really bad skin and now I'm with somebody who I love yeah. in America and it's very 
regulated to me and I have a check once every six months, so I know where my levels are at. Yeah, so it's a delicate yeah, balance of getting it just balance. right. So I'm going to talk also about uh, one or two other skin conditions, because whilst we're here, it's like you can never have enough of this in terms of what's important to think about, but just milia. Yeah. So milia are these very deep, you might get them also, in a way, some people have rosacea, have those little white, deep, embedded um, bumps mm -hmm. and would you say they're the same as milia or they're slightly different and because I when I sometimes am touching a woman's skin I mm. see what I think is milia so it's, it's like hardened keratin so the the oils come through and it's hardened and it's really not great to try and get it out yourself in my opinion that's right you yeah. need a good facialist yeah. to be able to yeah. do that or extract that for you yeah. but milia is quite common and rosacea is actually pretty common as well yeah. so it's entirely possible that Something one person could have both yeah milia is also really common if you're using really thick heavy eye creams so you mm. often see it around the eyes yes, yeah. so that can be another potential mm. trigger but then there's something else called sebaceous hyperplasia, which can look a little bit like milia, but mm -hmm. they're like little yellowy bumps on the skin. Yeah. And they just get more common as one gets older if you've had sun exposure. Oh, so yeah. if you've got sebaceous hyperplasia and it's not milia, no amount of extracting is going to get that out. What you probably need is it essentially either acid it away with mm -hmm. a little bit of trichloroacetic acid or using something called a hyphricator and just popping them open with a bit of heat and electricity. So I think and letting them uh, open, out. open out. So I think a lot of it is if it's not responding like standard milia, it might not be standard milia. And th you sound so knowledgeable on the, that finite difference. How many dermatologists, well, how many, you know, it's like how many facialists would know that difference? I'm going to ask you. Do you think it's a really easy <sighs> to see difference or do you think... It's, I think this comes from experience, yeah, I think, really. Yeah. Um, I've never heard similar. that before. Yeah. yeah, and I'm going to write that down afterwards with you because yeah. I think it's really interesting to see the difference. And yeah. And I think many people who talk to us just talk about this. They have, they don't think it's milia, but it's sort of this. And the eye cream thing. I mean, this is why I haven't done an eye cream yet, because I remember speaking to so many um, plastic surgeons. They said they sort of were doing somebody's facelift and they pulled it up. And, you know, there was the result of that pocket of blocked pores yeah. from so much heavy eye cream. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, probably the most common cause of milia is heavy eye creams. Yeah. Do you use eye cream? Um, intermittently. Intimacy. Just checking. So quite <laughs> myself, everybody who comes in yeah. here, do you use eye cream? Um, I think I'm just, I'm challenged by Facebook today. So I just want to say, I think we've asked, a lot, I've covered a lot. Yeah, You've been yeah. so knowledgeable. Um, I love the way you translate um, language so that people can understand. And I hope that's been helpful for you. And that we, I feel I've learned stuff today, which I love doing. And I hope you have too. All right. Bye. Bye.